Solar Eclipse, Part 1 of 2, from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia, http colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org. A solar eclipse occurs when the moon passes between the Earth and the sun, thereby obscuring Earth's view of the sun totally or partially. This configuration can only occur at the new moon phase, when the sun and moon are in conjunction, as seen from the Earth. In ancient times, and in some countries today, solar eclipses are attributed mythical properties. Total solar eclipses are no doubt very frightening events for people unaware of their astronomical nature. The sun, source of all life, suddenly disappears in the middle of the day. The sky darkens in a matter of minutes, and some animals start panicking or go to sleep. Fortunately, however, the spiritual attribution to solar eclipses is now generally limited to an illustration of the humbleness of mankind. Total solar eclipses are very rare events for a given place on Earth. This is because totality is only visible where the umbra of the moon touches the Earth's surface. Some people travel to the most remote places imaginable to observe eclipses. A total solar eclipse is considered by them to be the most spectacular natural phenomenon that one can observe. The 1999 total eclipse in Europe, which was without doubt the most watched eclipse in human history, helped to increase public awareness of the phenomenon. This was illustrated by many people willing to make the displacement to witness the 2005 annular eclipse and the 2006 total eclipse. The next total solar eclipse will be that of August 1, 2008. Section 1. Types of Solar Eclipses There are four types of solar eclipses. A total eclipse occurs when the sun is completely obscured by the moon. The intensely bright disk of the sun is replaced by the dark outline of the moon, and the much fainter corona is visible. During any one eclipse, totality is visible only from, at most, a narrow track on the surface of the Earth. An annular eclipse occurs when the sun and moon are exactly in line, but the apparent size of the moon is smaller than that of the sun. Hence, the sun appears as a very bright ring surrounding the outline of the moon. A hybrid eclipse is intermediate between a total and annular eclipse. At some points on the surface of the Earth, it is visible as a total eclipse, whereas at others it is annular. Hybrid eclipses are therefore rather rare. A partial eclipse occurs when the sun and moon are not exactly in line, and the moon only partially obscures the sun. This phenomenon can usually be seen from a large part of the Earth outside of the track of an annular or total eclipse. However, some eclipses can only be seen as a partial eclipse, because the umbra never intersects the Earth's surface. <clears throat> the reason some solar eclipses are total and others are annular has to do with the elliptical nature of the Moon's orbit around the Earth. One of the most remarkable coincidences in nature is that the Sun lies about 400 times as far from Earth as does the Moon, and the Sun is also about 400 times larger in diameter than the Moon. As seen from Earth, therefore, the Sun and the Moon appear to be about the same size in the sky, about half a degree in angular measure. Because the Moon's orbit around the Earth is an ellipse rather than a circle, at some times during the month the Moon is further away, and at other times it is closer to Earth than average. When a solar eclipse occurs while the Moon is at its closest, near its perigee, it appears large enough to cover the bright disk or photosphere of the Sun completely, and a total eclipse occurs. When it is at its farthest, however, near apogee, it appears smaller and it cannot cover the Sun completely. In that case, at the time of greatest eclipse, there remains a thin annulus or ring of brilliant Sun left uncovered, hence the term annular eclipse. Slightly more annular eclipses than total eclipses occur because on average the Moon lies too far away from Earth to cover the Sun completely. The ratio between the apparent sizes of the Moon and that of the Sun is called the magnitude of the eclipse. Hence, a total eclipse has a magnitude larger than 1, while an annular or partial eclipse has a magnitude between 0 and 1. Hybrid eclipses have a magnitude so close to 1 that in some places on Earth it is larger, and in others, smaller. Terminology Central eclipse is often used as a generic term for a total annular or hybrid eclipse. This is, however, not completely correct. The definition of a central eclipse is an eclipse during which the central line of the umbra touches the Earth's surface. It is possible, though extremely rare, 
that part of the umbra intersects with Earth, thus creating an annular or total eclipse, but not its central line. This is then called a non-central total or annular eclipse. The term eclipse itself is actually a misnomer. The phenomenon of the moon passing in front of the sun is actually an occultation. Properly speaking, an eclipse occurs when one object passes into the shadow cast by another object. When the moon disappears at full moon by passing into Earth's shadow, the event is properly called a lunar eclipse. But when the moon passes in front of the sun, we see an occultation of the sun by the moon. Therefore, eclipse of the Earth would actually be a better, though uncommon, term. Section 2. Eclipse Predictions Geometry of an Eclipse the umbra is the region in which the sun is completely obscured by the moon. The small area where the umbra touches the Earth's surface is where a total eclipse will be seen. There is also an area called the penumbra in which a partial eclipse will be seen. The moon's orbit around the Earth is inclined at an angle of just over 5 degrees to the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun, the ecliptic. Because of this, at the time of a new moon, the moon will usually pass above or below the sun. A solar eclipse can occur only when the new moon occurs close to one of the points, known as nodes, where the moon's orbit crosses the ecliptic, hence the name. The moon's orbit is also elliptical, which means that the distance of the moon from the Earth can vary by about 6% from its average value. This means that the apparent size of the moon is sometimes larger or smaller than average, and it is this effect that leads to the difference between total and annular eclipses. The distance of the Earth from the Sun also varies during the year, but this is a smaller effect. On average, the Moon appears to be slightly smaller than the Sun, so the majority, about 60%, of central eclipses are annular. It is only when the Moon is closer to the Earth than average, near its perigee, that a total eclipse occurs. The Moon orbits the Earth in approximately 27.3 days relative to a fixed frame of reference. This is known as the sidereal month. However, during one sidereal month, the Earth has moved on in its orbit around the Sun. This means that the average time between one new Moon and the next is longer and is approximately 29.6 days. This is known as the synodic month and corresponds to what is commonly called the lunar month. The moon crosses from the south to the north of the ecliptic at its ascending node. However, the nodes of the moon's orbit are gradually moving in a retrograde motion due to the action of the sun's gravity on the moon's motion, and they make a complete circuit every 18.5 years. This means that the time between each passage of the moon through the ascending node is slightly shorter than the sidereal month. This period is called the draconitic month. Finally. The moon's perigee is moving forward in its orbit and makes a complete circuit in about nine years. The time between one perigee and the next is known as the anomalistic month. The moon's orbit intersects with the ecliptic at the two nodes that are 180 degrees apart. Therefore, the new moon occurs close to the nodes at two periods of the year approximately six months apart, and there will always be at least one solar eclipse during these periods. Sometimes the new moon occurs close enough to a node during two consecutive months. This means that in any given year, there will always be at least two solar eclipses, and there can be as many as five. However, some are visible only as partial eclipses because the umbra passes either above or below the Earth, and others are central only in remote regions of the Arctic Circle or Antarctic. Path of an Eclipse during a central eclipse, the moon's umbra, or antumbra in the case of an annular eclipse, moves rapidly from west to east across the Earth. The Earth is also rotating from west to east, but the umbra always moves faster than any given point on the Earth's surface, so it almost always appears to move in a roughly west-east direction across a map of the Earth. There are some rare exceptions to this which can occur during an eclipse of the midnight sun in Arctic or Antarctic regions. The width of the track of a central eclipse varies according to the relative apparent diameters of the Sun and Moon. In the most favorable circumstances, when a total eclipse occurs very close to perigee, the track can be over 250 kilometers wide and the duration of totality may be over 7 minutes. 
Outside of the central track, a partial eclipse can usually be seen over a much larger area of the Earth. Occurrence and Eclipse Cycles Total solar eclipses are rare events. Although they occur somewhere on Earth approximately every 18 months, it has been estimated that they recur at any given place only once every 370 years on average. Then, after waiting so long, the total eclipse only lasts for a few minutes as the moon's umbra moves eastward at over 1,700 kilometers an hour. Totality can never last more than 7 minutes 40 seconds and is usually much shorter. During each millennium, there are typically fewer than 10 total solar eclipses exceeding 7 minutes. The last time this happened was June 30, 1973. Observers aboard a Concorde aircraft were able to stretch totality to about 74 minutes by flying along the path of the moon's umbra. The next eclipse of comparable duration will not occur until June 25, 2150. The longest total solar eclipse during the 8,000 year period from 3000 BC to 5000 AD will occur on July 16, 2186, when totality will last 7 minutes 29 seconds. If the date and time of a solar eclipse is known, it is possible to predict other eclipses using eclipse cycles. Two such cycles are the Saros and the Inix. The Saros cycle is probably the most well known and one of the best eclipse cycles. The NX cycle is itself a poor cycle, but it is very convenient in the classification of eclipse cycles. After a Saros cycle finishes, a new Saros cycle begins one NX later, hence its name, NX. A Saros cycle lasts 6,585.3 days, a little over 18 years, which means that after this period, a practically identical eclipse will occur. The most notable difference will be a shift of 120 degrees in longitude due to the 0.3 days and a little in latitude. A Saros series always starts with a partial eclipse at a pole, then shifts over the globe through a series of annular or total eclipses and ends on the other pole a couple of millennia later. Final totality. Due to tidal acceleration, the orbit of the moon around the Earth is unstable and becomes approximately 3.8 centimeters more distant each year. It is estimated that in 600 million years, the distance from the Earth to the Moon will have increased by 23,500 kilometers, meaning that it will no longer be able to completely cover the Sun's disk. This will be true even when the Moon is at perigee and the Earth at aphelion. A complicating factor is that the Sun will increase in size over this time scale. This makes it even more unlikely that the Moon will be able to cause a total eclipse. We can therefore say that the last total solar eclipse on Earth will occur in slightly less than 600 million years. Section 3. Historical Solar Eclipses A solar eclipse of June 15, 763 BC, mentioned in an Assyrian text, is important for the chronology of the ancient Orient. This is the earliest solar eclipse mentioned in historical sources that has been identified beyond reasonable doubt. There have been other claims to date earlier eclipses, notably that of Mersili II, likely 1312 BC, in Babylonia, and also in China, but these are highly disputed and rely on much supposition. Herodotus wrote that Thales of Miletus predicted an eclipse which occurred during a war between the Medians and the Lydians. Soldiers on both sides put down their weapons and declared peace as a result of the eclipse. Exactly which eclipse was involved remained uncertain, although the issue has been studied by hundreds of ancient and modern authorities. One likely candidate took place on May 28, 585 BC, probably near the Halys River in the middle of modern Turkey. An annular eclipse of the Sun occurred at Sardis on February 17, 478 BC, while Xerxes was departing for his expedition against Greece, as Herodotus recorded. Hind and Chambers considered this absolute date more than a century ago. Herodotus also reports that another solar eclipse was observed in Sparta during the next year on August 1st, 477 BC. The sky suddenly darkened in the middle of the day, well after the battles of Thermopylae and Salamis, after the departure of Mardonius to Thessaly at the beginning of the spring of 477 BC, 
and his second attack on Athens after the return of Cleombrotus to Sparta. Note that the modern conventional dates are different by a year or two, and that these two eclipse records have been ignored so far. It has also been attempted to establish the exact date of Good Friday by means of solar eclipses, but this research has not yielded conclusive results. This concludes Part 1 of Solar Eclipse. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the GNU Free Documentation License, available at www.gnu.org slash copyleft slash fdl.html.